I'm going to give it a minute for the participants to join us. Just going to give it a few minutes. We have many participants joining us on our webinar today. And if you would like to go on Facebook Live, we are also Facebook Live as we speak, or if you have friends, you want to text them and tell them to go on AAUWMH on Facebook or AAUW Morgan Health for Facebook Live. Okay. So I am... How am I going to minimize this, Yvonne, so that we could see my share screen? Okay, let me just share screen. I'm just going to share a screen really quick while we're waiting for participants to come on. There we go. Okay, so my name is Marion. Sacco, and I'm the president of AAUW Morgan Hill chapter branch. And um, I would like to have you note that we have 10 cities in Santa Clara County in our inner branch council. They're listed at the bottom of the slide. And we represent seven different branches um, in Santa Clara County of AAUW. The American Association of University Women has been a leading voice advancing equity for women in education, the workplace, and society since 1881. AAUW is committed to ensuring that everyone gets the same opportunity to learn, earn, and lead. We support women with scholarships and fellowships, training on salary negotiations, and financial literacy. There's a yearly leadership training conference and mentorship and encouragement of young girls interested in high impact STEM fields. AAUW's research ranges from an 1885 study that helped dispel the myth that a woman's fertility is impaired by attending college to ongoing work that shines light on the persistent barriers to equal pay for women. AAUW's advocacy has helped pass numerous laws in support of women, including the 1963 Equal Pay Act, the 2009 Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, the 1993 Family and Medical Leave Act, and what we're here to talk about today, which is Title IX. When we began our journey of of uh, planning this event. And I look, heard the word Title IX, the first thing that I thought of was Billie Jean King, but that's my generation. I am very, very privileged to be opening up this session with a group of young women advocates for today's Title IX, and this to celebrate the 50th anniversary. So I am going to stop sharing my screen and I am gonna do a quick introduction of our moderator today, Ms. Danielle Slayton. She is a retired American professional soccer player. She's currently the director of the external relations with the School of Education and Counseling Psychology at Santa Clara University. She's very busy. She's also a soccer analyst for the San Jose Earthquakes, Fox Sports, NBC Sports California, and NBC Sports Bay Area. Ms. Slayton also serves on the National Advisory Board for the Positive Coaching Alliance, and she conducts Positive Coaching Alliance workshops in the Bay Area for coaches, parents, and athletes. Ms. Slayton is also a member of the Board of Directors of the Bay Area Women's Sports Initiative. In 2010, Danielle traveled to Paraguay as a Sports United Sports Envoy hosted by the U.S. Embassy. In 2006, Danielle joined the coaching staff of Northwestern University as an assistant coach. 
She was a five year member of the United States Women's National Soccer Team and that won a silver medal at the 2000 Olympic Games in Sydney, Australia. And she was a member of the third place 2003 World Cup squad. She has played for the Carolina Courage and Women's United Soccer Association. She also is born in San Jose and went to Presentation High School where she led that soccer team to three CCS championships. So with that, I am gonna leave you and turn the presentation over to Danielle. Well, thank you very much, Marian. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Welcome to everybody who is joining us on Zoom. Welcome to everybody who is with us on Facebook Live as well. Happy Women's History Month. Uh, there's just so much going on and I am so happy to be with you today and joined by some amazing women who you will hear from shortly. Uh, we're obviously here to talk about Title IX the 50th year anniversary, so a massive year um, uh, in the passing of that historic piece of le legislation. But we're not only here to talk about the past, we're here to talk about the present and the future and why this piece of legislation continues to be so important to us today and something we need to continue to shine a light on. Um, a quick bit of housekeeping. Feel free to type in the chat, type in Facebook Live. Um, if you have questions as they come up, I'm gonna do my best to keep this as conversational and as fluid as possible so we can get as much information out in the next hour as possible. Um, I feel very, very fortunate to be here with you all today. I feel like I'm a bit of a Title IX baby in the way that there was so much explosion of women's sports and college athletics in the 90s, particularly women's soccer at the time, as universities really started to understand the law of Title IX, work towards compliance and work towards implementing what this law was intended to do. For me, specifically on a sports front, though the legislation covers far more than sports, but I feel so fortunate because there is no way I am at Santa Clara University playing soccer, making the national team, following my dreams and continuing to be able to give back to my community, if not for that one door that was open to me to play sports in college. So I feel forever grateful. Um, I feel like I'm a living, breathing example of one way that Title IX can be so important. And I'm very excited um, to hear from other women like me who are gonna share more about this as well. So with that, I would first like to introduce you to Marlene Bjornsrud, a woman of many talents who was also an athletics administrator at Santa Clara when I started my freshman year there. So she was very much a part of helping me get my opportunity and opening the doors for me. I'm gonna read a little bit about her bio. Um, her career has spanned more than 40 years of leadership in women's sports and nonprofits. Marlene has coached and been in athletic administration at the university level. She's been a general manager at the professional women's level. She was the executive director of the Alliance of Women's Coaches, founded the Bay Area Women's Sports Initiative, commonly known as Bossy, uh, a nonprofit organization that serves elementary kids from underserved communities. Um, and she continues to be a speaker, an advocate, a leader, an all around badass in this space. So Marlene, with that, I'm gonna kick us off with the first question and hopefully you can give us a little bit of the history and the overview of Title IX. Would love to do that. Thank you, Danielle. It's so good to see you so grown up. <laughs> um, you know, before I talk specifically about Title IX, I feel like it's important to acknowledge that all of us are standing on the shoulders of women who've come before us. None of us got here alone. And as Danielle said, many serve to open the doors for all of us to go to college, to play sports, to take the benefit of education. I want to acknowledge the four women who were the first ever to attend higher education at Oberlin College in 1837. I don't know their names, but I feel like they have gigantic shoulders that we're standing on and that's precious. Also the women who founded AAUW in 1881, who understood the value and benefited from the value of college and wanted to open the doors for everyone. And in my opinion, AAUW continues not just to open doors, but to kick the doors down. 
and keep them open for everyone who comes behind and follows us. You know, Nelson Mandela, more than 100 years after AAUW was founded, said, education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. The AAUW women knew that already, and he put beautiful words around it. So you take those early pioneers, and then you fast forward to the 60s and 70s, when changing social norms began to open the floodgates to women who wanted to pursue college degrees. And by the 1980s, more than half bachelor's degrees were awarded to women. But it wasn't just the social norms changing that opened the doors to colleges for women. It was a law passed in June of, two, of 1972 called Title IX, a 37 word law that really changed the course of history for every woman and girl in our nation. Those 37 words state, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any educational program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Title IX was the great door opener for all of us. Now, does that mean that access, opportunity, and protections that, provided, that are provided by Title IX need to long, no longer be fought for? Oh, how I wish that was true, but it's not true. In fact, Title IX is a law, federal law under the Civil Rights Code that unfortunately, the enforcement of it depends on who's in the White House and what that administration wants to do. So for example, from 2008 to 2016, the White House administration established the Council on Women and Girls as a full-time office that existed simply to advise the president about everything, every piece of policy that crossed his desk that, and how it affected girls and women. So we experienced significant growth in terms of enforcement of Title IX and enforcement of all its protections during those years. On the other hand, from 2016 to 2020, Title IX was basically ignored and lessened. The Council of, on Girls and Women was one of the first offices to be axed in 2016. And even the protections against sexual harassment that are provided by Title IX was undermined by our own Department of Education. So in May of 2020, the current White House administration is writing new regulations, especially as it re um, refers to sex discrimination and sexual harassment. So you can kind of see that in terms of Title IX, we have this roller coaster ride where you're kind of going up and you're holding your breath, you don't know what's ahead. And then all of a sudden you're coming down the other side and you're either screaming with delight or you're screaming in fear. So this is the way um, Title IX has been experienced. For many of us, as a 70 year old woman, I feel like my experience of Title IX was very much involved in intercollegiate athletics. So for example, in 1979, I was coaching a women's tennis team and we were challenged to raise every penny we needed to buy uniforms. That same year, the men's basketball coach made a mathematical error when he was ordering jock straps for his team and he needed 144 but instead ordered 144 dozen that meant he had 1728 jock straps for a team of 16 athletes and i had to raise money to buy uniforms for our team this was life seven years after title IX became law then in 1997, as an administrator at a prestigious Division I institution, I discovered that the women's softball team was wearing hand-me-down uniforms from the men's baseball team. 
The men's baseball team got new, new uniforms every year. This was 25 years after Title IX became law. And just last year in 2021, the world saw the discrepancy of equity that the NCAA uses in, in uh, the men's and women's basketball tournament. That's 49 years after Title IX became law and we're still having these huge issues of equity, very visible in terms of the world of sport. The curtain has now been pulled back. It's been ripped away so that the world can see now when there is treatment that is unequal. In fact, just last week, some congressional leaders sent a letter to the NCAA saying that the, the new way that the NCAA is treating women's basketball is still inadequate and lackluster. As someone who worked in NCAA athletics for so many years, I have zero confidence under the current leadership that there really is going to be significant, significant change for women that we can see that's palpable, that's real. So while it appears that under the current administration, we don't have to hold our breath a whole lot about Title IX and its enforcement, there is another brewing battle happening, happening under Title IX. And that is regarding female transgender student athletes and their right to compete on teams of, of women and girls. While I don't have answers to this, what I would appeal to the women leaders in sport who have begun publicly battling about this, be careful that the words you choose do not shame athletes. We know that the trans community has a very high percentage of suicide. They're struggling in so many ways. Let's figure out how to civilly talk about this with each other and take different positions without shaming the human beings that need to be recognized as human beings. So years ago, someone gave me a plaque after I had founded Bossy that Danielle, Danielle mentioned. The plaque says, I want every girl to know that her voice can change the world. I want every woman to know that our voices can change the world. But we cannot change anything if we don't know the law, if we don't embrace the law, if we don't face that roller coaster ride and come out better for it. So today, what I wanna challenge us with is the fact that girls are gonna be standing on our, on our shoulders now, and it's our responsibility to wake up, stand up, and speak up for the access, opportunity, and protections provided us through Title IX. So thank you for allowing me the privilege of making some comments. And I wanna turn it back over to Danielle and this incredible panel of women. I have a question for you, Marlene. Sorry, you said too much good stuff. So I, I need to dig just a little deeper, right? Um, because you said at this very end, right? We need to wake up, stand up and speak up. Like, give me an example of what that means for maybe someone like you, someone like me, or even someone in high school who is maybe just hearing about this for the first time, is not the president of the United States, doesn't have necessarily a huge platform. Like, give me some examples of, of how we can breathe life into this today. Uh, great question, Danielle. And, and I think the first challenge is to wake up, which means we cannot go to sleep and think that just because there's a federal law called Title IX that everything's okay now. Um, so we've got to wake up, which also means teaching the next generation. You know, Tara Vandeveer, the amazing Stanford women's basketball coach, uses her camps to teach fifth grade girls about Title IX every single summer. So you cannot go to Tara's camp without coming out learning a little bit about Title IX. So all of us owe it to wake up and teach the next generation. 
then we need to stand up when we see something in our high schools, in our junior highs, even in, thankfully in California, there's even regulations about Title IX kind of regulations in park and recreation programs. When we see that girls are not being treated equitably, we need to stand up and we need to speak up. It does no good to, to as someone once said, be asleep in the light uh, when we know what's right. So yeah. hopefully that helps a little no, bit. That, that, that's wonderful, right? Like if you see something, say something, and it's all of our responsibility. So thank you, Marlene. Um, that was really, really great to get us started. Um, next, we're going to have Lucy Jane Bledsoe. And Lucy Jane Bledsoe is a novelist who has received many awards for her fiction writing, so many, in fact, that I am not going to name them all because we'd be here for far longer than an hour. Um, some cool fun facts about Lucy, though. She's traveled to Antarctica three times. She loves to teach workshops, cook, do anything outside, tell stories. She loves all things basketball. So I am sure she is uh, enjoying this time of year with the women's and the men's basketball tournaments getting kicked off. Um, now I'm gonna kick it over to you quickly, but because um, I didn't mention all of your awards, what I do want you to answer for me before you get into our Title IX discussion. First, I wanna know of the writing awards that you received, which one you're most proud of and why? Well, hello everyone. Um, I thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this. I'm just honored to be a part of this panel with folks from the Equal Rights Advocates and the Women in Sports Initiative, Bay Area Women in Sports Initiative and AAUW. I'm just very honored to be here, thank you. Um, I don't know if I could say which award I'm most proud of. You know, honestly, what I love about my work is being able to, uh, share ideas and stories that mean a lot to me, like about Title IX. So I'm just going to leave it at that. What, that means much more to me. Yeah, I have my newest, I will say my newest book is coming out in a month. It's called No Stopping Us Now. It's my personal Title IX story. Um, and it's for young adults. And that's my passion to have, have these conversations. Um, the few remarks I'm going to make right now actually answer exactly your question, Danielle, to Marlene. Um, you know, what does it mean to be a young person and what can you do to help this change? Although I'm gonna talk about myself as a young person 50 years ago. Please. Um, yes, Title IX is very, very, very personal to me. Um, it changed my life in a huge way. Um, I grew up in a family, a big family, seven, uh, five kids, uh, very, and this, this is the story I'm telling now is part of the story that I tell in my new book, No Stopping Us Now. Um, we were a very athletic family. My grandfather was actually the football coach at Michigan State in Princeton for a while. Um, my brothers played um, football, basketball, baseball. Every summer, my dad would throw all of us in the car. We'd go to these city track meets where even girls could participate. We, we built whole tracks in our front yard and high jumps um, stations. And thankfully, my two brothers taught me how to play baseball and basketball. Um, they loved coaching, so they drilled me, um, and I was very grateful for that, but I didn't have a team to play on, because um, there were no girls. This was uh, in the early 70s. There were no teams for girls. I could play individual sports in high school, um, tennis, which I did. Um, I could play golf, which I didn't, um, but I spent my whole childhood um, in the winters at my brother's basketball games and in the summers and the evenings at the ballpark, and I loved, loved these evenings. I loved watching them play, but of course, I desperately wanted my own uniform. I desperately wanted my own coach. Probably more than anything, I wanted a team. It's probably my favorite part of being an athlete um, is that sisterhood of a, of a team and what that means about working for a goal together and um, what I eventually learned that means and what it teaches me about people and work and, and life. Um, so what I did is when I was in grade school, I talked to the PE teacher and letting us use the gym one night. And we talked to a couple moms into come watching us play. And when I got to high school, um, I talked to PE teacher into coaching a girls team for the city league. So we would play in the city league and we, the principal let us use the gym from 6am to 8am every morning because no one else was using it. This girls 
PE teacher volunteered her time. She did it for free. She would come at six in the morning to coach us and then drive us to our evening games. Um, and, you know, it was just, that was all we had. So one day, and this is part of the story that's a little sad for me because there was this vice principal at my high school named Mrs. Martin. We made terrible fun of her as kids do, you know, the way she looked, the way she was so strict and stuff. And I never, it took me years before I realized I should have thanked her. I wish I could have thanked her for doing this, but she called me down to her office and I thought I was in trouble because she was very strict. And she told me that Gloria Steinem was coming to town to speak at the, uh, this is Portland, Oregon, to speak in the um, Portland, Oregon auditor auditorium. And they wanted a youth representative on stage with her. And did I want to do that? And so, yeah, yeah, sure. You know, whatever. We all knew in the 70s who Gloria Steinem was. She was just iconic, the most famous feminist. One interesting thing I'm learning as I start doing events with my new YA book is a lot of young people have never heard of Gloria Steinem, which is a little shocking to some of us older folks. But anyway, um, I did this event with Gloria Steinem and um, she was amazing. She was smart, kind, soft smoke, spoken, funny, t terribly reasonable and rational. And so it was just like, great. And I got up in the morning and I read the newspaper, the Portland Oregonian, and was shocked by what I read, how this reporter portrayed her. And I was you know, brought up also in a political family. We believed in freedom of the press and the truth in the press. And I'm gonna read a line that was in that article about the Gloria Steinem event. In attendance, this reporter wrote, were the usual lesbians, lunatics and bra burners. And it was just, and of course, back then lesbian was a derogatory term. Um, it just made her sound like a crazy person as the media often did. And it was, entirely different from what I had experienced of Gloria Steinem, that was a huge lesson in activism for me, um, how we were going to be portrayed when we spoke up and used our voices. Um, at that event, I did learn about Title IX. This was 1974, so it was two years after it had been passed. And a couple older women came up to me and said, because I had said on stage something about wanting to, you know, wish I had a basketball team. They said, hey, do you want a basketball team? You want to work to get one? I said, okay. So I started working with this group in Portland, Oregon. And we went down to the uh, Oregon legislature and testified to the lawmakers there. Um, we testified to the Portland School Board. Um, Again, we ran into uh, poor little naive me, uh, all kinds of um, obstacles. I kept it, luckily I have this a scrapbook I kept of the entire, <laughs> it's all, it's a, it's a wreck now, but I have this one letter from the school board to my high school principal. And the last sentence of it is, and it's about me and my testifying at a school board meeting. The last sentence of this letter from the school board to my high school principal is, my suggestion would be that you refute the girl and defend your high school. So that's, that's how that was met. Um, I got attacked by coaches in my high school for speaking up at the school board. Literally the boys basketball coach found me in a dark hallway, took me by my shirt, pushed me against a wall and said, you better stop talking, you'll be sorry. I mean, this is, I was like, I just want a basketball team. <laughs> um, a couple other coaches um, did similar actions. My best friend at the time was a boy on the boys basketball team. And uh, the boys coach was telling them to spread rumors about me that were completely derogatory. Um, so it was quite the education and activism where I thought I was just asking for a law to be enforced. Um, I was just asking to play basketball. And I learned how that was not so simple. Um, I'm not gonna tell the whole story right now, but um, I have thought a lot about what I want younger folks trying to make change to know. And one of it is you don't know where you're gonna find allies. Cause in the course of this time when I was being attacked by the coaches in my school and by the, ex the school board and my own principal, um, the boys football coach came down the hall toward me one day and I was like, oh boy, because he was real stereotypical. He was like a big round guy, red face, crew cut. And I thought, oh boy, here we go, you know, attack number five. And he put his big old arm around me and walked down the hall with me and, and didn't say anything for a long time. And I'm like, oh, sh you know, what's going to happen now? And then he just quietly said, girl, I'm with you all the way. Um, and, you know, I always tear up a little bit when I remember this guy and uh, he becomes a big part of the story later um, and being an ally and helping us out. Um, so 
I guess I'll stop right there. Um, but I just, I guess I want young people to know that, um, you know, the question about what is Title IX for you, you have a right to a full education, you have a right to have that education without being harassed sexually or otherwise, you get all the things that boys get. So I want people to know that. I want people to, girls, to believe their truth, no matter how many people call you a liar or tell you what your truth, what you have experienced is, is not happening because they will tell you that. They will tell you that what you are experiencing didn't happen. Um, so believe your truth. And I guess the last important thing I learned is the steps of activism are small and determined. Um, when Title IX passed, it took thousands of girls like me and the women I was working with to do what we were doing all over the country, little steps speaking up over and over again. And it doesn't seem like much at the time, but the, the cumulative force is what makes change. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Lucy, for your courage, for your determination. I mean, Marlene said it, right? We all stand on uh, someone else's shoulders. So thanks for letting me stand on yours. <laughs> um, all right, next up, we have uh, Jess Eagle. Jess Eagle is a, a passionate social justice activist who, advocate, excuse me, whose work in journalism, political grassroots organizing, nonprofit development, continues to help us break down gender stereotypes and make the world a better place for women, girls, and non-binary people. She manages the Equal Rights Advocates Media Relations and Digital External Communications. Jess has been a development director helping domestic violence survivors as well. She has worked on a grass, as a grassroots organizer and also created an online magazine focused on feminist pop culture commentary and LGBTQIA equality called The House of Flout. I love that title, that is fantastic. Before I ask you your question, Jess, I see that Marlene has her hand up. Is that on purpose or is that on accident? <laughs> She was just so moved by Lucy. She was just like raising the roof figuratively. But I have no idea how that got there. Okay, cool. Well, I just want to make sure you're good. Um, I'll find how to take it down. No worries. Um, good job, Lucy. <laughs> okay. So Jess, many, many people have only heard about Title IX with regards to women in sports, right? Um, we heard both Lucy and Marlene and myself talk about that as well. But what other protections and benefits not related to sport does Title IX provide and how has it affected other areas of education such as sexual harassment, access to STEM classes, those kind of things. Yeah, well thanks Danielle um, for leading today's discussion and um, to the folks at AAUW Morgan Hill for hosting us, Marion and Peg at AAUW San Jose. Um, and to my fellow panelists, thanks so much for sharing your stories and your passion about this issue. Um, so at Equal Rights Advocates, where I work, we've been focusing on the sexual harassment and sexual assault aspects of Title IX, like you said, Danielle, um, and uh, for students and school employees. So the way that um, you know Title IX protects, it was created to protect equal access to education and school programs like sports. Um, regardless of a person's gender. So that includes people who experience gender-based violence now. And, you know, at ERA for decades, the attorneys have been working to expand that understanding of gender discrimination in education. Um, so, you know, those experiences of sexual harassment and sexual assault obviously affect a student's or a school employee's access to education. Um, because if you're sexually harassed or assaulted um, by a classmate or a coach or a teacher, um, obviously, even if it doesn't take place on campus, that's going to affect your ability to learn in the classroom if you're sitting next to the person who harmed you or, you know, um, you know, your ability to participate in school programs and sports. Um, and like Marlene mentioned, unfortunately, these experiences, sexual harassment and assault have been politicized, you know, for a very long time. But, um, you know, the White House, depending on who's in the White House, it's been, uh, they've used Title IX to either attack women and people of other genders who are experiencing gender-based violence um, or try to protect them more like the Obama administration tried to do. Um, so when students are coming forward uh, to seek basically safety and comfort on campus after one of these experiences, um, they're, you know, they're not trying, most of the time what we hear from students is they're not trying to 
you know, be, uh, get revenge or anything like that. They just want to feel safe and comfortable on campus. Um, and so that's what we're focused on at my organization, um, helping them do. Um, and they also, a lot of the time say they don't want other people to experience what they've been through. So a lot of the time, unfortunately, people who don't understand consent um, are kind of serial harassers or serial, serial assailants. And so people just want to protect other people from this person. Um, and so, you know, the options that they have for that protection for themselves is um, through Title IX, they can ask their schools to move the harmer out of their dorm if they have to live in the same dorm as that person, um, or ask them to be moved to a different class um, so they don't have to be in class with that person, or, you know, to be enrolled in classes with that person in the future. Um, or, you know, what we're seeing a lot of more recently is kind of a, a more restorative justice approach to this. Um, and in Title IX, those are called alternative resolutions. Um, that's gaining ground where the survivor can kind of customize the outcomes of their case, um, even sometimes outside of Title IX, um, just by reporting the process. So, you know, that can look like having the harmer listen to your testimony about it to really, you know, hopefully understand a little more about what they did wrong and learn or asking them to attend consent classes or issue a formal apology. And I don't want to talk about that too much because my colleague Rebecca is really, you know, the restorative justice expert and um, well versed in those types of solutions. So, um, so can I ask yeah. a question? Yeah. If I'm at a school, whether it's high school, college, does every school have a Title IX office or how do I know who the Title IX contact person is? Like, how do I, if I'm just hearing about this, if this isn't told to me, how do I figure it out for myself? Or as Lucy was mentioning, right, we never know where our allies are going to come from. How as a potential ally can I find the resources that I need at my school? Yeah, um, that is a great question. And unfortunately, uh, it's not always been clear to students or employees um, how to even contact their Title IX person, who their Title IX person on their, at their school is. That's something we've been working on with schools to try to make that very clear to people. I mean, the internet exists now, so it'd be very easy for schools to have a Title IX page. And a lot of schools are starting to do that. You know, um, the UC schools are pretty good at that. Um, but uh, it sometimes takes some asking around to find out who that person is in your school. And, um, but luckily there are also resources available, like people can contact us for help at Equal Rights Advocates through a free legal helpline. Um, and, you know, there, there are lots of other organizations that can help. Um, but yeah, like you mentioned, it is unfortunately not uh, a priority at some schools um, and, and it really does require a lot more work to make the, that information available to students. We have a lot to do. Yeah, well, that's wonderful. And, uh, I'm sorry, Jessica, may I give the le a legal answer for Please. so people uh -huh. know what's required? Yes. Jess is my wonderful colleague. I'm privileged to work with her. I'm sorry I'm off camera, everyone. I, I have a child care duty today. Uh, I'm an attorney that works with Jessica Eagle. Um, the, it, the legal answer to Danielle's question is um, under Title IX regulations, every school that receives any kind of federal funding for anything, even a scholarship or even building one building is required to have a Title IX coordinator. And that's under the federal regulations, even the ones the DeVos administration issued. Um, so it is legally required. If you go to your school and find they don't have one, they are in violation of the law. In California, we have an additional requirement that that person's contact information is um, legally required under our California Education Code to be posted in an accessible part of the website. So it should be easy to go to your school's website and find that person. Now, as Jess said, a lot of folks aren't following the law. So you may find when you go looking that it isn't easy to access or they don't have a person. Um, and then uh, as Jess said, um, there are resources to help you there, but also know that what you are experiencing is a violation of the law. Right, and as Marlene said, wake up and then stand up and then speak up. Um, Dr. Akila just dropped a, a something in the chat as well, a resource, Know Your Nine, um, college resources on Title IX. So, be sure to snag that um, if that's of interest to you as well. Thank you, Maha. And thank you, Jess, uh, 
much appreciated to both of you. Um, let's see, next we are going to move um, on to Dr. Akila carter Francique. Um, first of all, thank you for those uh, that resource. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. carter Francique. She is the direct executive director of San Jose State University's Institute for the Study of Sport, Society, and Social Change, and an associate professor in the Department of African American Studies. She earned her PhD in sports studies from the University of Georgia. She's been an assistant professor at Texas A&M University, at Prairie View A&M University, and oh, by the way, she was a track athlete at the University of Houston, where she specialized in the 100 meter hurdles and the long jump. So Dr. Akila carter Francique. That's a lot. I like to call you Dr. Akila for some reason. Yeah, just easy. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of um, you have done <laughs> extensive research um, on how communities of color have been affected by Title IX. So can you share your perspective on that and help us understand a little bit about next step, steps in advancing educational equality, particularly for groups of color? Yes. Well, first, again, in, in concert with uh, the lovely panelists here today, just want to say thank you to AAUW for inviting me on this panel um, and have an opportunity to sort of share not only the work that I do, but the life that I've lived um, in, in this um, effort when we talk about gender equality, gender equity, um, and Title IX. So with regards to communities of color, uh, we don't have enough time to really go deep because, you know, I'm a professor. We got to have a whole, I think we need a whole semester uh, uh, on this and a curriculum to really talk about and sort of unpack some of the lived experiences when we talk about our communities of color. Um, there's been a rich history um, and we can go all the way back to, and I'm going to, yes, use sport as the, the, the impetus for this, but the, the notion is that while Title IX didn't specifically speak to sport. Sport has been able to shine a light and been used as a platform to see a lot of the inequities um, and see a lot of those um, discriminatory practices come to the fore. For communities of color, I mean, historically, you know, as a Black community, here was a space when we talk about sport that was deemed acceptable for Blacks to participate in this notion of entertainment, this notion of cultural expression, to be the entertainment for white society, if you will, that's where Blacks could thrive. As labor, um, again, as players, not necessarily as leaders. Uh, with respect to women in this space, it was also deemed a, a good space for women to be able to participate, Black women. To, and it was something that was embraced by the Black community. So much so that when we think about um, the women that participated, whether it be um, in basketball, in bowling, in roller derby. I mean, these women were sponsored by local back, Black community entrepreneurs, you know, newspapers, if you will, to be able to have equipment and to travel and to participate. So in that space, in that community, it was something that was embraced. But stepping outside of those walls was a little bit more... I would say treacherous, <laughs> if you will. Um, and, and because even so, these women excelled in these sports, but they weren't deemed as our white collar sports. So they weren't playing tennis. They weren't necessarily in golf. They didn't have access to country clubs, you know, and so, or to, to, to greens to swimming pools and things of that nature in abundance in those communities. So there was limited participation for um, those women outside of the black community and to be able to perform and thrive. It, the, the notion of stereotypes really stepped to the fore about what black women, who they were, what they are. Um, and in many ways deemed akin to men, deemed animalistic um, for participating in basketball in track and field. But on the community side of things, I'm proud to say that I'm, I'm part of that lineage of, of the Tennessee Tiger Bells, of the Wilma Rudolphs, the Wyoming Tyuses, of the Althea Gibsons, of the Aura Washingtons, of the Peter sisters, Pete and repeat. You know, so Black women have thrived in so many different spaces with such grace. Wendy Hilliard, gymnastics, um, you know, they have, they have stepped to the fore with regards to advocacy, Flo Hyman, 
University of Houston Cougar, volleyball player, and again, our reason for our National Girls and Women in Sports Day. So, you know, those women have had an opportunity to be in those spaces, but still, particularly when we talk about the space of, of, of sport participation, I want us to keep in mind that there are still barriers to this legislation. Part of it because it is a single access legislation and that it will protect those, right, based on gender, but if you fall or live at the intersections of race, of religion, of sexual orientation, then those individuals have much more challenges in that space. And for Black women, that has been the case. You know, utilizing the work of Dr. Richard Lapchick at the University of Central Florida that, uh, you know, even talks about in the college space in particular, that Black women are in a space that they're lagging behind. They're not in those leadership positions were couched in sports of basketball and track and field. And so with that, there's those limited representation that we have. And to go along with that intersectionality, I do use the work of Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw talking about notions of, of structural inequities that are taking place, of political inequities that are taking place, as well as representational inequities. And so those are the things that we still have to speak to, to be able to create spaces so women of color can access these spaces and places, yes, even as youth, and move throughout the time, not only youth, but to high school, coming on to college, and then moving into those professional spaces, not only as athletes, but also as leaders, administrators, coaches, presidents of organizations to be able to thrive. And so, you know, for me, it, it, it's, it's one where there's so much to break down in regards to women of color, and again, like I said, I don't think we have time today, but I want us to keep in mind when we talk about women of color and their participation in these spaces of sport, in their spaces of education and access to not only their bachelor's degree, but their master's degree, right? Their doctorate and PhD that I was able to achieve as a student athlete, that they're still facing these structural barriers these barriers of racism, these barriers of sexism, these barriers of understanding their sexual orientation and religion, and how that also affects them on a larger scale when we talk about access to healthcare, when we talk about pay equity, when we talk about even funding support as parents or women that are participating, trying to live that Olympic dream, right? We still have to keep in mind this notion of political intersectionality, and again, how policies and practices marginalize issues. So yes, to my, my colleagues with the equal rights advocates talking about sexual abuse, sexual harassment, hiring and firing experiences, access to facilities, and still considering Title IX and its three-prong rule, and even sex testing. And then, you know, last but not least, again, that notion of representational intersectionality. And that speaks to the historical and sort of contemporary productions of images, right? The imagery of women in sport and how that subordinates those particular groups and affects them negatively, and how we begin to critique these images in a, um, either in a negative way, well, obviously in a negative way, but not only from their being there or lack of seeing them on the screen, right? But even to how they're objectified in those spaces and places. And what that means when a woman of color walks through the door for employment, she's seen before she's heard. Yeah. So how does that reflect to their leadership, this notion of angry Black woman? Yeah. How does this, what does this mean in their media um, visualization, characterization, or hypersexualization of these women? And so those are the things that I think also become much more tangible now in the social media era and this media space for our youth to want to engage in sport. When our young Black girls, those numbers trend down around middle school. You know, and so what's the, we got to think about, you know, what does that mean um, in understanding what sports are available to them? Who are their coaches? But also understanding that even Black girls, this is beyond sport, but just in general in the education system, they're being kicked out of schools because of those stereotypes and attitudinal thoughts about who they are. When we talk about college sport level, thinking of the emerging sports that are coming, this is a great opportunity with respect to Title IX. Yes, but those sports are in aerobics and tumbling, equestrian, rugby, triathlon, and women's wrestling. Are Black women, are women of color in those spaces? Do they have those opportunities is a question. 
And then when we talk about this notion of health and wellness, what does that mean? And this is the part that really is near and dear to me when we talk about the mental health and wellness for black girls and women of color, not only as youth participants, not only as those college and high school participants, but even in those leadership positions to be an army of one in some of these spaces and places, how do we navigate the microaggressions that we're dealing with on a daily basis? And I think of, and this is a hard moment, um, Chelsea Christ, who was a former Miss USA, who was also USC track and field athlete that took her life. So it's those things that we have to think about when we talk about um, women of color in sport. So my charge to many of you out there is in alignment with everyone else that's on this panel is to be reflective on your current positionality. Identify what power and authority you have to help sort of redress some of these structural, political and representational issues or barriers, if you will. And how can you become an advocate? How can you become an activist to not only change policies, but my big thing is, is shift the culture. And so I'm gonna share a couple of toolkits with you, one stemming from um, San Jose State on our recent National Girls and Women in Sports Day event that we had in partnership with the Department of Athletics, the Title IX office, um, Gender and Women's Studies, um, as well as a host of other offices, but namely my dear colleague, Mel Day, who is an art and art lecturer at San Jose State and started the Wall of Song Project um, to talk about this sort of call to action and using music and these collective voices to speak up and speak out and bring people together to be able to um, really push forward some of these respective um, uh, initiatives uh, and other calls of action. And, you know, the second one I want to drop is just my dear colleagues that are in this, this effort with me that are women of color, sports scholars. Um, we call ourselves sister docs, but we recently had a great panel discussion on the National Council of Black Studies, sort of sharing some of the issues and challenges that I just spoke of that pertain to women of color, um, particularly black women. And we'll be speaking, um, you know, even soon in about a month at our um, uh, North American Society for the Sociology of Sport to talk about these issues furthering. So I'm looking forward to, to hearing the rest of the panelists. But again, so much to do, so much to say, um, but we just have to continue and stay steadfast because many of these inequities repeat themselves in different new ways. So we've got to continue to have everyone involved in that conversation. Yeah, are you gonna put those in the chat, drop those resources? Yes, I okay. will, about Wonderful. to do that here shortly. Thank you very much. Um, Finally, we have Rebecca Sheff. Um, Rebecca Sheff is the program manager at Equal Rights Advocates. She has worked with restorative justice for Oakland youth and has traveled throughout the Bay Area teaching and engaging youth in restorative justice practices or restorative practices. Rebecca was a community liaison and has testified in front of the state assembly advocating to eliminate juvenile delinquency fees, particularly in Alameda County. Um, she, as just mentioned, is a colleague at Equal Rights Advocates. Um, so welcome, Rebecca. My question for you, um, you've been involved with youth movements many times, most recently the walkouts of students uh, in San Francisco schools over the lack of Title IX enforcement. What can you tell our audience today about the best ways to organize, to be advocates, and what new generation tools um, and organizing methods do you see emerging uh, in current times? Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to talk about this um, and just wowed by hearing all of my fellow panelists this morning or this afternoon. Um, so my work at ERA is like you said, focused on restorative justice, community organizing, advocacy, um, as well as every single student that reaches out to ERA for legal assistance or resources. Um, I hear their story personally and communicate with them. So this puts us in a unique position to identify these trends, identify these questions that students have about Title IX and their rights. Um, and it's how we created the toolkit that my colleague Jessica Eagle put in the chat. Um, but it also has allowed for us to be in these positions to assist students that are engaging community organizing um, and identify what their questions are, how we can help um, and really keep our you know, finger on the pulse of what's going on. So we hosted a symposium with high school students all over the Bay Area. 
um, that were running protectors accounts on Instagram to spread information about sexual violence um, on their campuses. And we learned a lot of what their biggest concerns are, what the threats they were facing, um, and, and were able to identify things like the, the fear of getting a defamation lawsuit um, in response to their activism from either respondents, parents, or even school administrators in some instance. Um, and so this was a, this fed into our, you know, toolkit again, that we were able to create these, um, these different documents to assist, but it also kind of creates the framework of um, learning what our position in this movement is, right? So, you know, for young people, the advice that we give and that we've kind of realized um, through this process is to trust your voice, trust your instincts, know that we are here for you and that you are not alone. This is your space. This is our space. This is, you know, we're here together. Um, and I think for those of us that have been in this, doing this work for a little bit, know when to step up and when to step back. You know, navigate your privilege as someone that's been, you know, maybe has more experience, life experience, has been in different positions of power, you know, to then amplify the voices of young people. And in our conversations with uh, those organizing these student walkouts, we really learned that that, you know, one, amplifying their message and their voices, that was a huge um, thing that they wanted to kind of achieve. And then two, uh, having the, the kind of backup that they needed, right? So what happens when uh, I participate and I do this organizing and we do a walkout and then I get in trouble at school? How can I avoid that retaliation? How can I make sure this doesn't impact my next educational goal? Whether that is they're a high school student and then going to undergraduate or they're in undergraduate and they're then going to graduate school. So being, knowing exactly what these students want and what the younger generation wants, I think that that's how we can help. Um, and then creating those resources um, for them. Where our experience and our knowledge meets their new ideas and their grassroots community organizing is a creative and restorative and fruitful, exciting place. So really focusing on, on that aspect of it. Um, and for the younger generation too, we were, we've been doing Know Your Rights workshops, we've been going to their high schools via Zoom, um, and, you know, answering directly what their questions are, and, and on our side, listening. What do they want to know? What do they need from us? And how can we be that for them? Um, there is power and knowledge and education, and so how do we leverage that, and how do we allow them to utilize us in the way that is going to be the most um, empowering and powerful for what their plan is um, in these walkouts in community organizing. Um, it's, it's important to take note that things change quickly in organizing and advocacy and social movements, they have these um, common themes that we see, but you know what worked 10 years ago, what worked 20 years ago, what worked when I was in high school is not gonna have the same impact today. So leveraging these new, you know, methods of organizing that the young students are using um, has been huge. Social media, as we know, it changes quickly. It's really, really um, a great resource and it is being used by the youth. You know, whether that's uh, spreading information to each other via Instagram, being able to remain anonymous so that schools aren't finding out about some of the walkouts and things that they're planning, that has been a big tool for them. Um, as well as creating these platforms where people can anonymously, anonymously share their story of how they've experienced um, sexual violence, sexual harassment, um, unequal access to facilities at school in an anonymous way, but then it inspires more people to speak up. It is inspiring more young people to get involved um, and then they're able to send it to us and they're like, look at all these stories, you know, what can we do? Um, and work with our communications team, which um, my colleague Jessica Eagle manages um, to, you know, do a storytelling approach um, and which only not only gets the word out, but is a huge restorative justice component um, because sharing your story is healing in nature for many um, and it can kind of, you know, shift your your healing journey to the next level. Um, yeah, I think it is our job as the advocacy experts, and for those on my team that are the attorneys as the legal experts, to take what we're learning from these students um, and, and not only 
research kind of the legal remedies to some of the barriers they're facing, but also incorporate it into our work. Um, at ERA, we do this, we're you know, listening to what they have to say and then infusing it into what our strategic actions are going to be, um, whether it's in direct services, whether it's in our, our impact litigation, um, in our advocacy work, in our policy work. Um, and so that's that's how we're we are utilizing um, what we're learning from this younger generation and able to produce the the resources they're asking for the community organizing consulting that they're asking for um, connecting them with free legal services. Uh, we talked about how to identify the title nine um, coordinators on your campus and how often people are like, I don't know, we had a Title IX coordinator and who is that Title IX coordinator? So hearing stories like that, we're able to work on projects, which we're you know, currently curating right now is a massive guide to Title IX coordinators to all the major schools that we can think of in their direct email. And we're gonna be able to finish that product hopefully over the summer and have that as a resource. Um, so yeah, listening, listening to what the younger generation wants and then for the younger generation to know like we have your back, we are here for you um, and we're, we're all in this together. That's great. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, thank you to everybody. Um, we're gonna stay on for a little bit longer because we have some questions um, and hopefully we can get through three or four of them. I'm gonna try to bust through them as quickly as possible. I'm not sure we're gonna be able to get to everyone, but. Um, Marlene, I'm going to start with you. We got a question from Gia, um, and Gia asked, can you uh, elaborate on the updates to the women's NCAA basketball tournament that was supposed to move closer to parity with the men's basketball tournament? Do you have any insight into that? No, probably just a little bit. What, what we have the insight on are the things that are visible. So if you watch television and you watch the branding on the courts, there's still a discrepancy there in terms of branding. Um, my understanding from the, the things that are not as visible, uh, I think the, the women coaches are saying that they've stepped up their ability to um, or, or what they're providing for the women in terms of meals, hotels, uh, locker rooms, those kind of things. Um, you know, one of the biggest things is they're allowing the women to be called March Madness now, which has been protected for only men. Now it's for both. So I, I think we're going to know more in two weeks when women are done competing and are much more at liberty to say exactly what was happening. Yeah. I can't wait for the day when it is called the men's NCAA tournament and the women's NCAA tournament. Like, for goodness sake, just put men's. Like, ooh. anyway, don't get me fired up. We're almost done. But just little things like that. Though I do have to say, I feel like I've noticed more media coverage this year than last year with regards to the women's tournament. Um, I feel like the debacle last year uh, hopefully, you know, shed some light on the inequities and there are in improvements made, as you mentioned, still a long way to go, but I'm hopeful. Still a long way to go. And I, and I think it's important to understand that those discrepancies are in all sports that the yeah. NCAA sponsors. Um, I am, I've heard from soccer coaches about the discrepancies, from tennis coaches, you know, it, within track and field, everywhere there are inequities that are less visible. And that's where I think, again, we need to wake up, look at those things, call them what they are, and challenge NCA leadership to, to make those changes. Yeah. Dr. Akila, what, what's your experience in that in college athletics and what you're seeing and hearing based on your work at San Jose State? <laughs> It's, it's, it's still, there's a lot of deficits. I think one of the things that I talked about, you know, and in, in even over the past couple of years with the confluence of COVID-19 and um, our Black Lives Matter movement is that we've seen a lot of, um, you know, these challenges sort of erupt even much more and how um, now we're, we're bringing in this nature of having, you know, diversity officers within athletics to be able to, to perform some sort of checks and balances. However, that individual is pretty much a designee, so they still don't have power. Um, and so I think what, what we're seeing is th there's still a host of inequities that are taking place. Um, as 
you've announced I'm at San Jose State and we have a host of challenges happening within our athletic department that are being remedied. Um, and so it, it's still here. And one of the big things to understand is that even in my research and investigations and working with colleagues, it's the culture of it, of the sport that we have to change. Because yes, we're shifting in the policies slowly, but again, accountability of that. And then the notion of the culture has to change, the thinking and the way that even our young girls understand their, the, who they are in these spaces, oftentimes they, they um, may think of themselves as less than just because we've, we've been socialized to believe that, yeah. right? And we look at the facilities and then we look at our uniforms, we look at the way that we travel, and then that begins to sort of affirm that, that notion that you are, are less than. So, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done. And as much as we have Title IX in these educational spaces and places, which I think is an important factor, is that when they step outside of that, set outside of educational institutions, it then becomes an additional challenge because these, uh, you know, Fortune 500 companies and these other businesses that they'll end up pursuing careers in don't necessarily have those same protections in those spaces. So it, it's, it's a constant um, challenge between educational um, institutions and then again, moving back and forth through those spaces and places and how they feel about themselves. But um, the tournament, uh, I, I thank you, Marlene, for sort of presenting that. You know, just look at it on its face. Yeah. You know, there, there's still some challenges. And again, our numbers are still not on par with that of men from a representational standpoint. When we talk about leadership, coaching, pay. Um, and so th there's still work to be done. Certainly, certainly. Um, question for Rebecca or perhaps Maha as well from the, um, from the chat. Do administrators at schools ever resist equal rights advocates coming to the schools? And how do you navigate that? Or are you always welcomed? Uh, they, we are definitely not always welcomed. <laughs> there is a lot of resistance and um, it varies. The resistance varies from um, uh, frankly, ignorance and um, downplaying the problem or uh, trying to just avoid difficult conversations to digging their heels in and insisting um, that uh, what they are doing to girls uh, is okay or that um, it is, uh, you know, the girls are suspect and the girls are the problem um, and uh, they need to protect boys and that the real threat is um, is these girls. Um, so we've had things ranging from schools simply not, um, uh, if, if we're not in a litigation or adversarial posture, simply ignoring us or not accepting our um, uh, invitation to discuss their policies and talk about best practices and fixes to, um, uh, and then we have to take a litigation posture because a nice thing about being a legal organization is if you don't want to hear about how you're breaking the law, I'll see you in court. Um, uh, but to uh, we've we've had extreme uh, to, on the extremities. We've had administrators at the K-12 level uh, threaten student activists with defamation lawsuits because they are speaking up and they are saying that they are survivors and they are saying their schools um, are ignoring them. Um, we've had administrators assist attorneys who were hired by. Um, the accused to per, to pursue defamation actions against uh, those those and I'll say it children uh, because it happens at the K twelve level at the university level we've um, obviously um, faced a cornucopia of um, bad behavior um, hearteningly though we are we do have some schools that do have people that really care and they just have never been given the resources, the training, or the autonomy to, to do this work. And sometimes um, you can tell, but you can really tell between the lines in a lawsuit, even in a deposition, when we're um, deposing an employee or uh, we're suing a school district or university and the employees are actually excited that we're there 
because now whoever's been stopping them from doing the work they want to do might be forced by court to let them do it. And um, we have received that kind of internal advocacy from administration. Um, we've seen administrators who the, the, the school board is the problem. And so, you know, while they do um, oppose the lawsuit, um, you'll find, we will find that they'll, they'll be very amenable to long-term relationships with us following um, adjudication or settlement of the lawsuit to fix their policies, whether they agree to writing that into the settlement agreement or they come back to us and engage with us after the case is resolved. So there are some really good actors um, who have been held down by the institution itself. And they do sometimes find that us coming in and suing them um, is an invitation um, for them to get to do the work they've wanted to do. Mm, that's, that's good to hear. Um, we're almost done. I have two quick questions for you, Jessica. Um, does Equal Rights Advocates work nationwide or is it just local to Northern California? I actually want to let um, Rebecca or Maha answer that in terms of the type of legal help we're able to provide out of state of California. Our advice and counseling line, um, we talk to students um, and workers all over the country um, and we represent, we represent students um, all over. Um, it, the level of services will vary um, depending on certain circumstances, but we we do talk to and work with and represent um, people all over the country. That's great. That's great to hear. And Lucy, my last question for you, how and where do we get your book? Oh, thank you for asking that. Um, it comes out in a month and you can pre-order it anywhere now from your favorite independent bookstore or from Amazon. It's a hold it up again. It's called No Stopping Us Now. And uh, yeah, if you pre-order it, that would be awesome um, in just about anywhere. Wonderful. Awesome. Well, thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you to all of um, all, all of those who were in attendance, both on Zoom and on Facebook. Um, I'm just inspired. I'm motivated. I'm fired up. I'm ready to do the work. Um, I'm ready to send the elevator back down for the next generation. And uh, and just thank you again to, to all of you and AAUW um, as well. So with that, I am going to turn it back over to Marion to close us out this afternoon. Hopefully she can pop into our Zoom room. Yes, I'm right, I'm right. Oh, there I'm you right, are. <laughs> I'm right here, yes. Let me just put up one last slide for us. And uh, again, this is the Inner Branch Council of AAUW. And these are our speakers and we thank all of you. This has been just a fabulous, fabulous uh, presentation. A recording will be on different areas, but specifically the Facebook live recording will be on facebook.com slash AAUWMH slash, or you go to Facebook to the Morgan Hill AAUW website, and that live presentation is there right now for you. And last but not least, I would like to say that there are some links, there are a lot of links came through. We will do a follow on, but the Student Survivor Toolkit is fabulous. There are a few different AAUW links for, uh, for equity, and we will follow up to everyone who registered on Eventbrite with just a follow up toolkit. Danielle, thank you so much. You were a fabulous moderator and a fabulous team of women. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.